I think of myself as a comedian who wrote his own material. And I found you know, over time that what's really true is that I'm a writer who performs his own material. So that's kind of uh, the way I define what I do. Beyond that, uh, there's, you know, entertainer, and there's a little scientist at work, too. I'm, I'm really lucky with uh, whatever kind of genetic accident happened for me. I born in 1937, so I grew up in Manhattan, New York City. Father was out of the picture. Uh, he uh, and my mother, he'd been shown exactly where the door was located. Uh, he was uh, a drinker and a little too, um, too much temper. And my mother decided I wouldn't be subjected to that. So she took off with me at two months of age and my brother at five years down a fire escape, very dramatic, uh, through a backyard in uh, the backyards of 112th and Broadway and into my uncle's car. And that, all of those things, uh, the fact that we were alone and on the run and on the road and improvising, I think had a big impact on me, especially the fact that I got in a, in a large way to invent myself. My mother was at work, she had a good, good career in, in advertising. Uh, my father had been a very successful public speaker in advertising. He was the national ad manager of the New York Sun and the New York Post. So I had my mother at work, no father in the home, and I was able to kind of create my own universe. And she to told us all the time to always think for yourself and, and do for yourself and be independent and know how to make a home and know how to find your way. And um, and I had some of that in me, and it just helped me to kind of create my life. I, I figured out my career when I was still about 11 or 12 years old. It wasn't a perfect blueprint, but I had it pretty much mapped out, and it worked pretty much that way. Because in fifth grade, I wrote my autobiography. I think that's the time to do it when you're 11. And the last page of it was what I want to be. And mine said, I want to be an actor, comedian, impersonator, announcer, a uh, disc jockey or trumpet player. And clearly the, the theme there is standing up in front of people and attracting attention to yourself. Hello there, thank you. I was lucky that I grew up in the golden age of radio and the golden age of television because the late part of radio was the best and the early part of television was the best and I had them both. And radio of course is, is, is it's a, a common place to say that it, it left the, everything open to the imagination because it was just words and you could form your own pictures. In 1943, I'm six years old and I'm beginning to get up and down Broadway on my own. The theaters along Broadway, the movie theaters then, and a few of them featured older movies that um, were in re-release. Suddenly there was this, um, this spate of horse feathers and duck soup and, and all the Marx Brothers movies and I began to see them and the anarchy of, of that. That's the fact that they could go through a hotel lobby, light a couch on fire, take a man's toupee off, and that all people did was go like this, you know. They, they weren't arrested or grabbed or anything. They would run. They were chased maybe by one guy. So that appealed to me, the just sheer nonsense and the uprooting of, of norms. It's 1947, I'm about 10. Danny Kaye appealed to me because of the verbal artistry. I was beginning to understand and be attracted to difficult verbal things, interesting lyrics of popular songs. I, I tried to learn uh, dry bones, dem bones, dem bones gonna walk around. I tried to learn bongo, 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 I don't wanna leave the Congo. Anything intricate verbally and difficult started appealing to me for some reason and I didn't even define it then, it just was going on. We lived on the cusp between the Columbia University neighborhood and what we called White Harlem, West Harlem. Columbia University neighborhood was, a, was the entire University of Columbia, which included Teachers College, which was directly across the street from my front door. Barnard College, this, the, the women's college, is there. St. John the Divine, the largest cathedral in the world, 120, 112th Street. At the foot of my street, there was this 23-story Gothic cathedral called Riverside Church, with the largest carillon in the world. Attached to it is the Union Theological Seminary, at the, also at the end of my street, the uh, largest Protestant theological seminary in the world, Jewish theological seminary on the next street, largest in the world, Juilliard School of Music, all of these institutional things of higher learning, higher attainment, 
And then down here we had the Cubans and the Puerto Ricans and the blacks in the street and the working class Irish and the interesting smells of cooking and the interesting music coming out of the windows and the Irish guys, my guys on the street corner, lots of us. There were a lot. The Irish had big families and there were hundreds of us within a 10 by 10 block area. And um, my mother, of course, wanted us to go up, up the hill, go up to up the hill, strive upward, reach, let your reach exceed your grasp. And uh, she would have loved that for us, and those were good aspirations. We, my brother and I, who was six years older, we weren't tight buddies, but we were close. Uh, we headed down the hill to the fun and the heat and the adolescent, the testo place where the testosterone could be best be exercised. And we kind of rejected all of that. When I was a little boy in New York City in the 1940s, we swam in the Hudson River, and it was filled with raw sewage, okay? We swam in raw sewage, you know, to cool off. And at that time, the big fear was polio. Thousands of kids died from polio every year. But you know something? In my neighborhood, no one ever got polio. No one, ever. You know why? Because we swam in raw sewage. It strengthened our immune systems. The polio never had a prayer. We were tempered in raw shit. I had a very good experience in first year high school. My grammar school was an idyllic uh, grammar school with, with wonderful, beautiful nuns. But high school was these brothers and priests with the brutality. And it was different. And, and I didn't like it. I rejected it. I knew uh, after first year Latin, I hated second year. First year was great. It was all, it was all uh, vocabulary. Second year was Punic Wars and translation. I didn't care about that. Uh, they bored the hell out of me, and I wanted to get on with my life. I wanted to learn how to be a disc jockey, to be a comedian, to be an actor. So I left, and um, I went in the Air Force as one of the ways to do that, to get away. And my mother and I were by now at loggerheads. I wanted to get away from that, and I just uh, joined when I was 17. I got her permission to join. I was in the Air Force, I was in Strategic Air Command, which was the real mother of everything, you know? At that time, there were no nuclear submarines, there were no silos with intercontinental missiles. There were only atom bombs and hydrogen bombs, and they were dropped by either B-36s or B-47s. I was in a B-47 squadron. Those were the primary bombers at the time. So we kept the peace for quite a while. There was, as I say, there was no triad of deterrence. We just had these bombers and that was it. I worked at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana and we had the H-bombs and they, I saw them, you know, I saw them with blankets over them, but they would, would load them into these B-47s and they'd do these mock runs all the time because that was the principle of SAC. Always have a certain number of planes in the air, another certain number on the ground ready to go. And I was a mechanic on these planes. I, I jokingly say I helped keep the peace. Because you'll notice that while I was in the Air Force, the Russians didn't pull anything. Before that, it was Korea. After that, it was Vietnam. But while I was in, they said, let's leave them alone. There's no question that, that my kind of um, makeup doesn't fit regulation and structure and authority. It never did. I rebelled. I happened to wind up with three court martials. One of them was um, falling asleep on guard duty during a unit simulated combat mission. I'm proud of that one. Failure to obey a lawful order. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And thirdly, uh, showing a certain amount of disrespect to a non commissioned officer. But I was very lucky I didn't serve any time, but these are not good things on the record. So it came. Time, and this is important to hear this, there, there was a period when Dwight Eisenhower, who is now president, they decided to cut some defense spending. And they decided to cut some military, certain number, 100,000 or something, or whatever, big number. And the Air Force, they said, cut some people out. And they, they said, in the particular case of the Air Force, they were looking around for people who had, there were three criteria. One was, you've been out of your career field for more than two years. Well, I had because I became a DJ and I didn't work at my job. Secondly, been reduced in rank more than twice. Well, there you are. <laughs> and thirdly, does not intend to re-enlist. Perfect. So these people were eligible under art, an article, a uh, regulation called 3916, an honorable dis uh, a general discharge under honorable conditions. And they... The colonel told me that shaky, we called him Colonel Matthews. He said, we're going to uh, 
we're going to let you go. I said, well, it's just as well, but you can keep the uniform. And um, went to Boston. I wanted to be in a big market. It was square peg, round hole time for me. I went to a place I didn't really fit. I was a 20-year-old with rock and roll roots, and I went to a station that played, quote, unquote, good music and had network affiliation, had, still had soap operas on radio from NBC. So I didn't quite fit there, but Jack was on that station. Jack Burns was a newsman. He and I roomed together with a third guy um, and found we had a great comic affinity. And we found we had this ability to improvise. And for the four months I was there, because I had to leave there, uh, unfortunately, before I had planned, Jack and I uh, split up and uh, didn't see each other and didn't think of any, anything of it. I, I wound up in Fort Worth with a good rock and roll job. How you doing? George Carlin here inviting you to become a member of our big swinging KXOL teen club. Big contest, big prizes, big fun for you and all of Fort Worth teenagers. Jack showed up there on his way to Hollywood to be a star and we, he, there was a news job just opened up that day and he took it. We developed the act there, and two months later we decided to leave radio and drive to Hollywood in my new Dodge Dart Pioneer two-door with the tinted windows in the AM FM. And we drove to Hollywood and, uh, you know, we took that fabled American trip west and it worked. It worked for, for both of us. Don't forget what had just come before uh, Burns and Carlin, before 1960, in comedy. Um, the, the individual comedians who wrote their own material and projected individual personalities had emerged. Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, Shelley Berman, Nichols and May, Bob Newhart, Dick Gregory, Jonathan Winters. These comedians in the, in the late 50s and early 60s had reshaped comedy, given it a new feeling, a new touch, and, and this was the beginning of what Tony Hendra calls boomer humor which was the sicko, irreverent, uh, holding things up for ri to ridicule and attacking them, as opposed to the kids today and crabgrass and my wife shops too much. As opposed to that, nothing sort of comedy. Uh, this was comedy about, uh, about um, values, the world, and, and in a lot of cases, self. We did things about the freedom rides, integration. These are now much dated terms, but uh, they were very on the edge then, integration, uh, and the KKK and the John Birch Society. So we tried to um, express our own sense of um, irreverence and uh, rebellion. We were very successful. We're, there are a lot of stories in my life that are, that are too perfect um, in terms of how fast some things happened and how, how lucky I've been. We, in, were in late 1959, early 1960, we were in our, this little apartment we rented. We'd watch the Jack Parr show. And the Jack Parr show was the place you wanted to go and be seen and heard then. Prior to Johnny Carson, it was The Tonight Show. It was after Steve Allen. It's where the new comedians were sometimes introduced. And you'd, you'd be watching it and everybody. And what we would do is improvise in interviews on the Parr panel, as if we were, let's say, like Johnny Carson but Jack Parr. And we would make believe one of us was Parr and the other was one of us. And he would say, well, tell us, uh, Jack, how did you two guys get together? And we would say stuff like, well, I was bawling his wife and he was uh, humping my mother. And, and we would just do these outrageous, improvised things about being on Jack Parr. That was February. In October of that year, we were on that show. That's just unheard of. That's, we hadn't formed the act yet. We hadn't certainly hadn't left Fort Worth, we were sitting there in our underwears with beer cans, Lone Star Beer, making these things up. And in October, which they say October, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, eight months later, we were on that show. Uh, so Burns and I did very well. We worked all the best nightclubs. We worked the nightclubs that Variety uh, reviewed. And we only stayed together two years. We went straight to the top, and then we, not, no, not, not truly, we went very close to being on our way to the top, and then decided, Ah, uh, this is, you know, we both, yeah, screw it. I wanted to be a single. I'd wanted that for a long time. I was now married uh, about a year, and I took over whatever momentum the team still had. I did a couple of sort of meaningless national television appearances, and I was kind of drifting, and I was in this nightclub stage, but it was uh, 1963 now, 1964, and the first 
hint of change was occurring, the free speech movement at Berkeley. I'd always been a pot smoker, by the way, from the time in my neighborhood. I'd always had a pot as part of my life, and I think it's a value-changing drug. I think it's a self-limiting drug, but it's a value-changing drug, and I think you see the world differently, and that was beginning to happen in the world, and I was restless with this straight path, because I had a kind of a, a, a two-track existence I figured out later. In order for me to follow this kind of mainstream dream, I had to play their game. I didn't call it that then, I didn't know these things then. This is how it was happening and I define it in retrospect. But I had to kind of follow their blueprint, which was, you went, I mean, where else are you gonna go? You're gonna go to television, you're gonna get on variety shows. I did things like the Perry Como specials. I did the Jimmy Rogers show. Hey, the, the way I broke through nationally was in 1966, in the summer of 66, I was on a show called Craft Summer Music Hall with John Davidson. We wore white pants all the time. Guys had striped vests and, and straw hats and things. I had to sing Winchester Cathedral. There, this was all very vanilla American. I didn't know how uncomfortable that was making me. I just knew how uncomfortable I was. And finally that all had to change. And what happened was the culture changed around me, it began to, it to really be um, significant. The anti-war movement, the um, introduction of acid and mescaline and so forth, and I myself did some a acid and some mescaline, which I think hastened my change, gave me the ability to, to feel these things and put them into motion. And that's what happened in the late 60s. I abandoned this other dream of mainstream path to Danny Kaye and thought, I'll be myself. I'll start talking about what's in my heart. So I was working at the Copa, and this stuff is, you know, it's just horrifying. They're just staring at me. So I began to tell them that I didn't belong there. I began to say to them, look at these places, this kind of places. And this place went out of style 20 years ago. They just don't know it yet. I said, if Cesar Romero dances past me one more time, and I see Dennis Morgan throwing someone out the front door, I'm getting out of here. I said to them, I said, I belong in the colleges. That's where I'm going, and this is where, uh, this will be history for me. And I, I would lie on the floor and underneath the piano, which was on my, you know, you sound, nightclub like that, you're on the same level as the audience. It's not a stage, it's a little dance floor. And I would lie on my back under the piano and read the, the label under there and describe the underside of the piano. Another time I brought the phone book out and I began to read from the phone book. I wasn't high then. I had, I had I'd already done my, my psychedelics, you know, months before. But I was, I was really acting out a, a terrific protest of my own. And I begged them to let me go. You know, I'd say, let me out of the contract. And Jules Podell, this legendary owner, he was over there with his ring. He'd bang on the table when he wasn't pleased with something. And I'd say, bang away, bang away. Why don't you let me? They wouldn't let me out of the contract because they knew they'd have to pay me off. So the last night during the second show, they just slowly faded my lights in the middle of my act and slowly faded my microphone. And I said whatever the white equivalent of free at last is, free at last. And, um, and I was okay. I was, that, that was a big one. I still had other things to do. I had other contracts to fulfill. I had that. I had an incident at a Playboy Club in Wisconsin. And then I had the Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas, which was the final thing. Howard Hughes owned the hotel. Howard Hughes Invitational Golf Tournament. These assholes were there. These, these drinking golfers, two very bad categories. And um, they, uh, they weren't pleased with, with me saying the word shit. The way I said it was very clever. I said, you know, I don't say shit, folks. Buddy Hackett says shit down the street. Red Fox says shit. I don't say it. I'll smoke a little of it, but I'm not going to say it. And uh, pretty soon, they're oh, this and that. And, and I, then I told them, I said, you're a bunch of fucking assholes. I said, a bunch of businessmen, assholes. You don't know shit. Now, whatever I said, something like that. And I, uh, I left, and <laughs> that was it. That broke the back of the whole thing. That was the final point when I was able to say, I'm going to the colleges and the coffee houses. And I told my wife, I said, if all I ever do the rest of my life is fill coffee houses every weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'll be happy. That's all I want to do, I'll do that. I knew there was a ready-made audience out there and changing culture. I didn't sit around and call it a changing culture, but the sense was in the air of what was happening. And I knew there was a place for 
individuality in comedy and speaking in the first person. I had this act that was still good, that was what I think of, I thought it was the middle class act. And I had these newer things that had been working on, I'd been working on and then were now ch a chance to develop them in coffee houses. And I, I, I conceived the album to myself of FM and AM, which was my first album. And the idea of it was to show that I was going from being an AM kind of a radio person, that is to say, very commercial and uh, mainstream oriented, to what in that time FM was. So FM represented that place I was going, AM was where I had been, and I just reversed them and called them FM and AM. And I did the two sides of the album. One of them is the older act, and the other side is the newer stuff. It wasn't exactly revolutionary, but it was new for me and different for them. The second one, Class Clown, came out in 73, which was the one that had seven words you can never say on television on it. The third one came out a year later, that was Occupation Fool. That's the one that had filthy words on it, which became the Supreme Court case. The first four albums all became gold, and um, that was my golden breakthrough. That was um, the first, well, that was my second heat, because I had been through these other you know, pretty nice exposure on this in the 60s there with Burns and then by myself and the Perico and all that stuff. And now here comes this third wave or another surge of exposure on a big scale. And uh, this was the one that counted and meant the most and lasted that led the rest of the way because it was true. It was about, it was about the real, whatever the heck this is, you know, artist, entertainer, uh, whatever that person was being represented correctly and accurately for the first time. In, in looking for these words, I kept finding new categories. We have so many ways of describing these dirty words. It's, well, we have more ways to describe dirty words than we actually have dirty words. That seems a little strange to me. It seems to indicate that somebody was awfully interested in these words. They kept referring to them. They called them bad. Words, dirty, filthy, foul, vile, vulgar, coarse, in poor taste, unseemly, street talk, gutter talk, locker room language, <laughs> barracks talk, body, naughty, saucy, raunchy, rude, crude, lewd, lascivious, indecent, profane, obscene, blue, off color, <laughs> risque, Suggestive. <laughs> Cursing, cussing, swearing, and all I could think of was shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. All I know is I had a piece of material called Seven Words You Can Never Say on Television. It was an honest uh, analysis from my standpoint of the inconsistency of our standards and as, as reflected in language about the body, the body's functions, especially as it re pertains to sex. Religion has crippled people uh, because it's given them shame and guilt about their bodies and fear. And this is expressed in these taboos that we have, including language taboos. And uh, I, I just thought it was fascinating that we have these, I, I was able to isolate the seven that had no other saving meanings to them, such as balls has another meaning to it. Uh, pussy has another meaning, and I tried to explain that in the routine. But these words, shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits, they are what they are. They don't have additional secondary meanings. And so I, I wanted to, that, that interested me. That, so I thought, wow, what do you know? I, I, well, I'll just isolate them. And it happened that they had, that I was able to arrange them in an order where they had this wonderful, euphonious sort of shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, tits to them. And I exploited that, and it was um, it was a way of uh, I guess doing a lot of things. I don't know. I didn't sit down and have conscious uh, uh, motives, except uh, this will be fun to do. This is interesting. I do this well, and this sort of needs to be said, not because society needs it, but because I need to I need to hear someone say this, and I'll be the one. You know, a radio station in New York played it. A listener-supported station, therefore no commercials. WBAI played that entire cut on, in, the, in the afternoon on a show called Lunch Pail. And they warned the audience. They said, this show today is about 
language taboos and some of the inconsistencies and so forth. And we're going to play something for you. If you're not ready for that sort of thing, don't like that, think you won't like it, please don't listen. Turn your radios off now. Uh, a professional moralist was driving around with his teenage son in, in the car. Someone from a thing, I think it was called Morals in Media. If not, it was something very much like that. He heard it, uh, listened to the whole thing. Apparently, he and the son were not morally affected by it. And uh, in a market in New York, with car radios included, that probably numbered 25 or 30 million radios, this was the only complaint the FCC received. And for whatever their reasons were, they just sanctioned the station, a $100 fine, and a little mark against your record when you come up for renewal. Uh, the station refused the sanctioning and decided to fight the FCC. That's really what happened. And they won their case in district court. It went to whatever levels first and then to district court, which is the Court of Appeals in D.C. It's a three-judge court, and they won that case. The radio station won two to one. So the FCC was overturned. The FCC went to the Supreme Court of the United States in 1973 with this case, and it took five years to go through the mill. In 1978, the Supreme Court voted five to four that uh, the FCC had the right to regulate what they termed indecent language. It wasn't uh, obscene because it didn't meet those tests, but it was a new kind of a new category of filth. I was sort of proud they had carved out a, a new category of filth for me, uh, initially for me, uh, called indecent language. You know, the perverse person in me loves the fact that that I'm a part of, uh, I'm a footnote in American legal history, the only case in the Supreme Court ever based on a comedian's uh, routine, and um, that they had to read these words out loud in court. I'm just proud of that. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, decided all by itself that radio and television were the only two parts of American life not protected by the free speech provisions of the First Amendment to the Constitution. I'd like to repeat that because it sounds vaguely important. <laughs> the FCC, an appointed body, not elected, answerable only to the president, decided on its own that Radio and television were the only two parts of American life not protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. And why did they decide that? Because they got a letter from a minister in Mississippi. <laughs> a Reverend Donald Wildman in Mississippi heard something on the radio that he didn't like. Well, Reverend, did anyone ever tell you there are two knobs on the radio? <laughs> of course, I'm sure the Reverend isn't that comfortable with anything that has two knobs on it. But hey, Reverend, there are two knobs on the radio. One of them turns the radio off, and the other one changes the station. <laughs> Imagine that, Reverend, you can actually change the station. It's called freedom of choice, and it's one of the principles this country was founded upon. Look it up in the library, Reverend, if you have any of them left when you finish burning all the books. <laughs> the, the, the media operators, the people with these radio and television stations, need to please their advertisers. They can't scare them away. They don't want to scare away this audience they're supposed to deliver. So they have to regulate themselves. And, and, and that, I don't think this thing with my case changed very much about what they would have done for themselves because their self-interest says, we have to watch it. There are people we can lose out there. The cable was what changed everything for me and, and, and other people. But I mean, in terms of that, these premium ch channels that didn't require commercials therefore had a, a way to, to do content that uh, you could see on Broadway, you could read in a novel, but that you couldn't hear in a place that was selling biscuits and tires and beer and insurance, you know. I began with HBO in 1977. I think the service itself started in 76. and. Once again, this incredible good luck of, of mine uh, occurred in that you can't be the hot new guy on the block forever. You're never the fastest gun in town for eternity. Someone else shows up or the world changes. And so I had my hot, my gold four albums and I had two, a little bit less than gold. And, um, 
And I wasn't really going anywhere in my thinking. Okay, so where am I going? By this time, disco had shown up. And that's, a, to me, a symbol of the fact that the revolutionary thing had worn off. That it was, whatever about it was going to stick was in place, and it was going to stick. And now we were off drifting. And that's what I was doing. Creatively, was drifting. And Cable came along and did something practical for me. It, it replaced the mass medium of albums for me. Gave me a way to reach large numbers of people with my act as it existed. With the albums essentially just record what you do and send it out. Cable takes a picture of it and sends it out. So I, I had a way to stay in touch. I kept doing The Tonight Show. I would host it a lot and I would be a guest and so forth. And I, I, I was able to keep touring and I was able to stay on the road 200, maybe 150 nights a year and earn money and fill places. And slowly I was just learning how to be a, a better writer and to produce more material because I had a need. I had to stay out there. Um, and Cable gave me a way of keeping interest up on a mass scale and getting my things... Um, on the shelf. I like, I like the fact that they're recorded, they're finite, you can look at them, they're on the shelf. There's my first show, 77, there's 78. And, and at the same time, it, it helped me mark time and, 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 and kind of keep exploring and, and, and finding a voice. Two things happened around, around very close to 1980. I developed a relationship with a new manager who had been a promoter of some of my shows, not all of them, in the, in the second half of the 70s, Jerry Hamza, out of Rochester. I got disenchanted, became disenchanted with my current management, and Jerry, I told him I was going to look for a round for manager. He lived in Rochester, New York, I'm in Los Angeles, and I didn't think of him for that. And I told him I was going to look for a manager and everything, and he said, well, what about me? I said, well, you know, you're in Rochester and stuff, and I don't know if you want to do that. And he said, let me come out to L.A. and let's talk about this. And uh, Jerry and I then discovered that I had a big IRS debt. Um, I'd done a lot of cocaine in the 70s and had not done responsible things with my own affairs. Uh, no one cheated me, but the managers, uh, the money managers, different group, business managers before Jerry were rolling over my IRS debt, which term still is unusual to me that you can say, oh, I'm going to give it to you next year. I don't know what that means. But anyway, I wasn't paying it. It built up a bit, and then there were things they had disallowed. What do you call them? Exemptions, deductions, uh, based on tax shelters, like my daughter's horses and the place we bought to put them and everything, all that stuff. Goofy. And um, disallowed things, and now there's more money. And, and, and penalties and interest that are retroactive to when you, you made the claim, not to when they decided it was a bad one, when you made it. And on top of that, these were pre-Ronald Reagan, <laughs> in a way, God bless him, I put that in big quotation marks. These are pre-Reagan tax rates. These are 80, these are 20 cent dollars, 30 cent dollars. This is a dollar where you earn a dollar, they get 70. So I was just going to never catch up. Penalties and interest, penalties and interest, penalties and interest. We located the IRS people, the dealership, let's call it, that was going to function with me in the Rochester office. Instead of L.A. where they're used to going after celebrities. Rochester folks, not that Jerry knew them, but a little less awestruck and, and, and able to, I don't know, um, function more like real business people. We started working on this debt. And he would stave off. He would give to the IRS just enough, just enough to keep him from the door. Had a lien on my house for 20 years. They never executed it. Jerry kept them at bay with a certain amount of money to pay my just debts in a proper way, and secondly, to, um, to, to help me function. But over time, I began to get some traction. In 82, Jerry said, we need a product. We need something I can hold up and show a guy. He put me in Carnegie Hall, and we did the third HBO show in 1982. And then he had something to show. My wife, Brenda, she produced those earlier shows. She produced the 82 show, and 84 show. 
Jerry and she, and, and she was very active. And um, it began to, you know, I began to, the HBO fed the box office, the box office fed the HBO numbers. We'd get, we'd get an advance on the next HBO show. That would finance us for a while. Not that we, it was the sole thing, but that would help out with what we were doing. And we eventually knocked these taxes lower and lower and lower. I only finished them last year. This is 2003. It was a 22 year, I won't call it a nightmare because I never took it personally. Yeah, I never said, ah, these taxes, the government, they don't whine. Pay your taxes, folks. Don't whine, don't complain. It's still the best place to be, even with all the drawbacks. But there it was. I owed the money. I paid it. I didn't want, and I wasn't a, a, um, a scoff law. They never got my house. They never came for it. They never did anything of those of that type. The lien came off eventually. But what, the point of the whole story is that I had this reason to stay out on the road. I couldn't entertain this idea. Oh, I'll do a little acting. I'll see if there's any interest over at this studio and that. Now I'll write this. Perhaps I'll you know and oh, I'll go down and do a comedy club, and I had that option. I had to work, and I had to, uh, Jerry was uh, ingenious, and I had enough. Uh, cachet from these HBO shows and from my history in seven, like 10 years earlier, that propelled me. We produced enough money to begin to knock this thing down. And then came 84, the show called Carlin on Campus, 86, 88. And now I'm beginning to find my voice. Did you ever notice when you go to somebody else's house, you never quite feel 100% at home? You know why? No room for your stuff. <laughs> somebody else's stuff is all over the place. And what awful stuff it is. Where did they get this stuff? And if you have to stay overnight at someone's house, you know, unexpectedly, and they give you a little room to sleep in that they don't use that often. Someone died in it 11 years ago. And they haven't moved any of his stuff. Or wherever they give you to sleep, usually right near the bed, there's a dresser, and there's never any room on the dresser for your stuff. Someone else's shit is on the dresser. <laughs> Have you noticed that their stuff is shit and your shit is stuff? I thought to myself, gee, I spent about 40 years with this need to tell people things. And when I did it in the least efficient way, I traveled to where they lived and stood up and said it to them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, the first book, Brain Droppings, only had two things in it that had been, had been stand-up material before. Stuff and baseball and football. And I put them in because they were semi-signature pieces. People identified me with them. The nice thing about writing from your own ideas, I guess from any ideas, but from your own ideas, from your nuggets, is that in trying to edit them and fix them so they work, new thoughts occur. They grow like the neural networks in the brain do. They find connections that you didn't think of originally, and suddenly a sentence or two is a paragraph. And the paragraph might sit, and as you go and you're way afield somewhere in your files and you find another paragraph, that you think, wait a minute, what was that other thing? And zoom, back to that. And that's what's great about this process, and that's what's great about the brain. My acting, well, uh, to go back to my boyhood dream, because I wanted to be like Danny Kaye. See, I saw Danny Kaye and Kid from Brooklyn and a couple of those movies, 47, 48, 49. I was 10, 11, and 12. And I thought, I can do that. And so that, to me, that was actor. I didn't think of Ray Land, Gregory Peck. I thought of guy in the movies, movie star, actor. I'll be an actor uh, like that. I'll be a comic actor. I didn't know that distinction. Comic actor. I'm going to be an actor. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm funny. I'll be a comedian first. If I'm funny enough, they'll have to let me be a funny actor. Because first you're a funny guy, and then they're coming. Okay, so that comedian first. Now, how am I going to get to that? Well, I love these disc jockeys I listen to. I'm really good with my voice. My mother bought me a tape recorder in eighth grade, and I learned how to run it and how to project and do a lot of things on the tape recorder. It gave me confidence. And um, so I'm thinking, I can be a disc jockey first, and that's safe because you're kind of separated from the audience. They can't see you and, and you know you know less risk and, and then if I'm good enough at that they'll have to let me be a comedian because I'll be a funny disc jockey and then if I'm a good enough comedian I'll be an actor and so I had this path and this dream I got on television in 65 66 67 68 69 I'm hot on television and that's my time now I'm still on autopilot autopilot says you're going to be an actor and that meant 
Now I'm ready to try out for sitcoms and movie parts. I was an actor on That Girl. I did, I was her agent in one episode. I did a movie uh, that same year or pretty close with Doris Day and Brian Keith called With Six You Get Egg Roll. What I found was I wasn't an actor. I didn't have the tools. I had no technique to fall back on. I had no training to fall back on. I had only this idea that this is my birthright. I belong here, I'm an actor. And now I find that it, you know, it's not just learning the lines. And, and by the way, I wasn't even doing true characterizations like actors do, I was doing characters. I found that you, you, it's not just these lines. The guy says to you, Oh, that was good. Now, let's do that again. I want you to, and he says, come down the stairs a little slower while you're saying the line. When you get to the bottom, pause on the second step up and look over there. The phone is ringing. Notice that, but think, look over toward the kitchen. You think maybe she's in there. And, and by the way, you cheat your look a little bit to, the, you know, I can't remember the lines that I'm going to think about all that shit. I'm completely not, I'm not going to be natural at all. And I wasn't. And I couldn't do it and I hated it and it was horrible. It was just like being on the Perry Como special. I was out of place. And I didn't know how to define all that. I, did, I couldn't label that at the time for myself. I just felt it. It was awful. But I knew enough to know that I didn't belong there. And I knew enough to know they would, they're not dumb enough to keep hiring a guy like this. So I... I slowly just kind of put that to rest. When the 70s happened and the records happened, here's my next burst of heat. Now I can be an actor again if I want. But unfortunately, I have a long, I have a beard, long hair, and I dress like a hippie, and I am known as a hippie. No one's going to cast me as the library trustee. <laughs> They're going to cast me as a hippie or an FM DJ or something. So it's all going to be typecasting, and I still couldn't act. So a car wash came along. I did that because they let me write my own dialogue and c create my own scene. It was one day I could get in, get out, and they left me alone. And you can have a beard if you're a cab driver. So I did car wash. But essentially, the comedy had taken over and, and this other stuff was going on. I still, you know, I still like to think about it. I was good in Prince of Tides later on. Because I was, by then, I was myself. And I had a little better access to myself or whatever the heck an actor is supposed to do. And then I did uh, a really good part in um, a Hallmark miniseries called Streets of Laredo. I was good in that. Because there was something on the page. There was something emotional to do. But I'll never really be an actor. I'll never really be a, a great writer. I'll be a serviceable writer who can get his thoughts across in a nice way, sometimes better than others. And I'll always ha enjoy 60 or 90 minutes on stage, and I'll always be good at that. In football, the object is for the quarterback, otherwise known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy, in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack which punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home <laughs> and to be safe. I hope I'll be safe at home, safe at home. But my, my dream is this Broadway show. I'm going to do a Broadway show in the fall of 2005. This is a, a, a qualitative shift for me. It's not going to be a Broadway show like uh, Robin Williams and Jerry Seinfeld did uh, one night on Broadway where they sort of kind of used Broadway as a prop to get it in the title. This will be a show that runs, I hope, six or eight months with, with two acts, a single theme. So I'm going to do a show called uh, Watch Your Language. And what, what that means is uh, keep an eye on your speech, your American speech. Watch your language. And... Um, that's, that's all it is. It's an exposition and my take on a lot of aspects of American speech, the way politicians talk, media, advertisers and marketers, politically correct speech, the, euf the influence of euphemistic language all across the board, and then just the way we talk, which is a lot about our popular vernacular. And this is the reconciliation with my mother, who wanted me to go uphill. See, this, this is that audience. She took me to a couple of Broadway shows, uh, among them West Side Story. And at intermission, I was 15, 
14, 15, 16 at the most. And at intermission, we'd sit and people would be drinking their orange drink or having a cocktail or whatever and smoking like crazy. And she would say to me, because she had refined uh, tastes, she was what they call lace curtain Irish as opposed to what she thought of as shanty Irish, which was the neighborhood that I was gravitating toward, the shanty Irish. You have breeding, she would say to me. You have refinement. Uh, and at these uh, intermissions, she would see someone and she would say, look at that man over there. Look at the way he's holding his glass. Look at the way he moves his hand when he speaks. Watch how he holds that cigarette. He's cultured, he has refinement. You have that. So, that, um, I'm gonna get a chance to, to realize that for her, in a way. Because um, when you throw out someone's um, influence, in that case, you know, trying to separate from a parent of the opposite sex, a differentiation, they call it, uh, you necessarily throw out the whole package. And I had to go, I had to turn my back on good things as well as what I didn't like about her. So uh, I'm going to reconcile that. Um, I didn't intend it that way. It's just magic the way life does these things. I had no notion, of course, how can you, that, that life would be this full and rewarding, this satisfying. This, th these, this many breaks, this, this much luck, this, uh, you know, it started lucky. It started with an accidental conception, not like the type we always talk about, but my mother and father had been separated for two years and they met on the street and decided to go to Rockaway Beach for the weekend. And I was conceived because they met. I was about to be aborted. I was in my mother's womb at, at uh, whatever it is, six or seven weeks or so after the pregnancy. My father's sitting next to her. She's ready to have an abortion. She'd had one earlier after my brother. And she saw, she thought she saw her mother in a painting on the wall. Her mother had died a few months previous. And uh, she took it as a sign and said, come on, we're gonna, I'm gonna have this baby. And they gave it one last shot together and it didn't work. But that was a freak. Here's the conception is a freak, being allowed to get out of the abortion and so I was 50 feet from the drain pipe, that's a freak. These things aren't supposed to happen. So there's been nothing but luck. Someone said the definition of happiness or success, I forget which, is finding what you love, doing what you love, being good at it, and being recognized for that. Those three elements. And I've had that, I couldn't ask for more. I've had two great relationships with, uh, with the women in my life. My marriage was long and good, although we had a lot of things to get through together. It was 37, 36 years. And uh, I met Sally Wade uh, five years ago. And we, we just, it was like a bolt of lightning. You know, it's just a wonderful relationship, Sally and me. I already know that anyone who talks about or writes about a comedy in the last quarter of the 20th century will have to include me. And, uh, and in a nice and prominent place. That's sufficient, you know, that's terrific. Now the epitaph I'd like is, uh, geez, he was just here a minute ago. <laughs>